Hello, and welcome back to The Road to 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will be your driver on this journey. Uh, today, of course, the big exciting action going on in the chess world is over on Chess24 with the Magnus Carlsen Invitational Finals and, of course, semifinals that just wrapped up. So I wanted to take a look at some games I really enjoyed from this uh, or the semifinals match. I believe the finals have yet to be played. Uh, of course, the semifinals saw a little bit of controversy when they first got started between Ding Loren and Magnus Carlsen. Ding, of course, having a very rough go of it in these online events as of late. He did manage to qualify for these finals, though, and uh, at least on the first day, he was giving Magnus a run for his money. So let's jump into game number one I wanted to show here between Ding Loren and Magnus Carlsen. I believe this was actually the first game they played in their first day uh, of the semifinals. And it was, in fact, Ding with the white pieces to, to lead it off. Uh, Ding essayed e4, and Magnus replied with c5, something he has been known to do lately. Magnus lately really leaning heavily into these Sicilian defenses, seeing a lot less e4, e5 than we used to out of the world champion. Uh, in the past two years after this match that he had with Fabiano, he has very much switched to the Sicilian. And to my knowledge, in classical chess, obviously it's been a while since they played, but this guy still remains unbeaten uh, since, uh, I think, before even the, the World Championship match. So, turns out he can play more than one opening. Who would have guessed? Uh, Ding responds with knight f3. We see d6, c takes, or sorry, d6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes, knight f6, knight c3, and a6, entering the Nidorf variation. Uh, now, Ding Loren plays the move f3. This is sort of an alternate move order that uh, can allow you to arrive at the English attack in many different cases. For example, if e5 were played here, knight b3, uh, bishop e6 for example, bishop e3 is pretty much the only move here, and then we are well within the English attack. However, in this game, we see that after f3, Magnus chooses not to stick with the Nidorf, instead playing the move e6. And while, uh, you know, this was still the Nidorf move order, these are more the Scheveningen positions that Magnus is uh, playing a bit more often. Uh, Ding still responds with bishop e3, and now we see a pretty stunning move from the world champion. It is a move that has been played in the past, but it's definitely an offbeat line. So fans of the English attack, or people who saw my last Chess Openings Explained video, uh, will have some idea of what white is trying to do in this opening. Generally, white is playing on the king side. The point of developing these pieces in this manner is to go for this move g4 and try to launch some kind of attack on the king side with g4, g5, and especially bringing this f pawn up as well to support this attack. So in the Nidorf, very often these days, the topical thing to do is after we develop all the pieces, queen d2, you'll see black play the move h5. And this is actually what I recommended in the Chess Openings Explained series. And the point here is to play against white's idea of playing g4 and make him find some slightly less comfortable alternate variations to apply some pressure to black here. And Magnus, uh, in his infinite wisdom, has decided that he wants to employ the same idea uh, from the Scheveningen. Rather than go for uh, the normal stuff of just b5, uh, first, Magnus includes this move h5. So I would like to ask the chat room to pause for a second. The obvious uh, upside to uh, playing h5 is that you are preventing for the moment the move g4. But I want to ask the chat room, what are the actual downsides to the move h5? Uh, with the exclusion that you can just say it generally weakens the king side. I'm talking specifics. Why is h5 not always the most comfortable move for black? What are the downsides here? See what you guys have in the chat room for me. And with my very limited Spanish-speaking knowledge, I see that Diego is asking me how many ELO points I have. I am around 2,200. 
So Oscar Ortiz has a very good point here, and that is the g5 square in particular is the relevant square that is weakened by the move h5. Yes, it's true that very often now black is going to shy away from castling kingside because it doesn't make as much sense with this pawn launched out here. You would rather have this rook to back it up, and in case the h file ever opens, the rook would be well placed. So the king side is generally weaker, as you can say, but the g5 square is going to be really, really relevant. The point being, now you never have this move h6 to kick a bishop off of g5. And so keep an eye out for this bishop g5 idea uh, a little bit later on in the game. Uh, why does bishop g5 matter? Well, we'll see in any position where this pawn eventually gets pushed to e5, the d5 square is going to be the crucial, crucial square for black to keep a hold of. And if after bishop g5, you can't get rid of this bishop, it's definitely going to loosen your control of the d5 square indirectly. So believe it or not, h5 indirectly is weakening the d5 square. Not the most intuitive, but that is sort of the, the linking chain there. h5 weakens g5, g5 is weak, so bishop g5 is often good. This bishop can attack this knight, which then loosens control of d5. So let's keep an eye on that a little bit later in the game. Uh, it doesn't make sense to do it immediately because Magnus has played this e6 move rather than e5, so d5 is still under control. So first off, Ding plays queen d2, preparing the queenside castle. Uh, we see bishop e7 from Magnus, natural development, queenside castles, and now Magnus does in fact play this move b5. Uh, now, Ding plays a pretty interesting move. It's a move that is always uh, pretty controversial in these openings with white. Generally, the standard way of meeting these ideas of b5 is you just sort of chill. You play the move king b1, you allow black to sort of develop the pieces, and then you can even start to challenge this b pawn with something like a4, or you can sort of go about your business uh, in other ways, something like bishop d3, start playing for f4, and uh, other ideas like this. Uh, in Ding's game though, he responds to b5 in a little bit of a different manner. And I think the reason he responds like this is directly because of Magnus Carlsen's h5. Uh, the move that Ding chooses to play is the move a3. And I think this is a, a pretty deep idea from Ding. The point is obviously that he wants to slow down the move b4. Now, why does he want to slow down the move b4? Well, a lot of it, uh, well, first of all, slowing down b4 is usually just a good idea, right? b4 is a huge source of counterplay for black. If you can slow it down, that's great. However, a3 often isn't the best choice for doing this because it very much does weaken white's queen side. There's uh, ideas of sacrificing pieces on a3. There's also ideas of when this pawn does, getting, does get in to b4, it will have the opportunity to immediately open files with something like b takes a3, uh, also getting time on the knight, things of this nature. So a3 often isn't the best idea for white here. But for the moment, it does temporarily slow down b4. b4 might be more effective if it gets played in the game, but it is very much slowed down. So because uh, Ding Loren has managed to slow down b4, he won't have to move this knight as quickly. That means that this knight can stay on c3 and pressure the d5 square. Once again, it comes back to the square of d5 in the game. Um, now, is this the only reason why Ding played a3? Uh, do I know this for a fact? This is why Ding played a3? No, but it does make logical sense, right? Magnus has weakened d5 with h5, so Ding is playing for more pressure on this square. And now Magnus plays a move that I'm going to call a little bit of a mistake. Uh, generally, the standard way of developing is with bishop b7 here, something like king b1, and uh, black can think about playing d5 in many cases, can think about playing e5 as well in some cases. Usually, you want to do something about knight f5 first, or just developing with knight bd7 and coming out to the queen side uh, with some, some counterplay. In the game, uh, Magnus Carlsen chooses to play the move bishop d7. And while this bishop does provide some good support to the b pawn, also keeping an eye on the e6 pawn, 
and indirectly the f5 square, keeping everything sort of solidly together. Obviously, you're starting to notice a pattern here. It's neglecting control of the d5 square. Uh, Ding Loren, still very chill, plays the move king b1, always a good improving move in these positions for white. Definitely makes sense to get off this open c file and control some of these squares over on the a file if anything bad were to ever happen. Uh, knight c6 comes on the board and Ding actually just trades off these, these knights and draws the black bishop out to c6. Uh, and now Unfortunately for Magnus, he was faced with a uh, pretty tough decision here. Uh, Ding Loren, in uh, the opening, has managed to apply quite a bit of pressure to the d6 pawn. And now after bishop f4, Magnus has to uh, you know, solve this issue. There's simply no way for black to continue defending this d6 pawn. And so there are two ways to solve this problem. Number one, you move it out of the way, play pawn to d5. Number two, you move this pawn up with pawn to e5. So thus far, I've talked about, uh, I've talked a lot about d5 control, but I don't think Magnus Carlsen is out of the game just yet. It's not like he did a ton of things horribly wrong. He just chose some specific lines that did loosen his control of d5. It's not as if white should be winning here by any means, but black does need to be cautious. He needs to be aware of uh, his opening choices here. So chat room, what do you think? e5 or d5? What is the way to go for black? What is the way to go? You have to solve this issue of your d-pawn somehow. A couple people in the chat room say e5 is the thing to do. And Quaffley says d5. So with d5, you have to be very, very careful. You have to make sure you're calculating accurately, make sure you're not missing anything. Uh, because this is the move that adds more tension to the center. That means white is going to have options to open the center, options to keep the center closed, options to just keep the tension and play some improving move, whereas e5 is a bit more forcing. But in fact, d5 is the correct way to go in this particular instance. And the reason is there's no good way for white to immediately open things up. This isn't actually achieving much. This uh, queen on d8 is... Uh, defended well enough for the moment, and if white tries to uh, take advantage of this pin, the simplest option for black is probably something just like queen c8. You can immediately step out of the pin, and there's no chance to play a move like c4 to break open the d file. And as far as how could play continue, well, sometimes you'll see this king actually come out this way, sometimes you'll see this king castle but black should be doing okay in this position. Now in the game, Magnus actually chose to play the move e5, and I definitely think this was where uh, Ding solidly grabbed the advantage. Now after e5, you probably guessed that the move bishop g5 might be coming, and now uh, already white is starting to, to take over the d5 square, and this is sort of the, the main issue here for black. There's nothing he can do to keep control of d5. In the game, he played the move queen b6. We see white trade off these dark square, this dark squared bishop for the knight controlling d5. Now after knight d5, we have takes, takes, and the problem on d6 is not going away. White has seized control of the d5 square, and in doing so, he's also traded off all but one set of minor pieces. Uh, the minor pieces that are left are this light squared bishop for white and this dark squared bishop for black. And neither of these pieces were either side's you know, favorite pieces in the position. Of course, white's dark squared bishop was a very powerful piece that he had to give up for this. Uh, black's knights over on, sorry, f6, I forgot where it was. Uh, over on f6 was doing a great job of defending d5, defending the king's side. But these are the pieces left remaining. So what is going on here? Uh, obviously, I've sort of already given away the fact that I think white is doing very well, but I want to ask you guys why. Why is white doing so well here? 
And I'll give you a hint. Part of it is, yes, due to this massive control over the D file. But I want to talk a little bit about these bishops. So what about the bishops makes this, posi this position so good for white? What about the bishops is it in particular that are giving white somewhat of an advantage here? All right, you guys are offering up uh, some general ideas saying white's bishop is better, but that's not what I'm, uh, not what I'm asking here. Uh, I'm sort of hinting that white's bishop is better, and that's why his position is better. But what makes white's bishop good in this position? There's a couple things in particular. <clears throat> Because if you look for the moment, right, this bishop's sort of locked in by these pawns, can't really go anywhere. It's also locked in by its own pawns on the king's side. Black's bishop is facing a similar, similar story, but you know, g5 is an open square. Maybe this bishop can, can get active. So yeah, you guys are arriving at the idea uh, now. And the point is, this bishop for the moment is hemmed in by these pawns, but after the key breaks c4, this bishop is actually going to become very, very active. You can imagine if this bishop lands on c4, challenging the f7 pawn, challenging the queen side, it's going to be a very active piece. In the meantime, let's say after king e7, played in the game to defend the pawn. In the meantime, black is going to have a much more difficult uh, job in trying to activate his dark squared bishop. Now, in the game, Ding Loren actually plays c4 immediately, which is a great plan to open up the bishop, as I said. But there's actually another move here that makes a lot of sense for white, and it's in the same vein, uh, the same vein of thinking. So, like I said, maybe bishop g5 and coming over to these sorts of squares is one day an active plan for black. And so the move h4 is actually interesting to consider as well, with the idea being you are locking black out of this square for the moment and locking this pawn on a square where it could later be targeted. But I do like c4 a bit better. Just wanted to mention this idea of not only activating your own pieces, but uh, keeping your opponent's pieces inactive. It's usually a fantastic idea. So c4 is played in the game, and b takes c4 is actually just going to be uh, sort of suicidal for black. Of course, there's no way uh, to really deal with this, and then the major pieces are going to start coming in for, uh, for white, for sure. So C, uh, b takes c is sort of ridiculous. You can't really get away with playing the move b for either. The move c5 is going to come, and pretty nasty stuff here. Or alternatively, this, and then I don't see the, the immediate tactic, but maybe just, just threatening the, the checkmate like this is good enough. Obviously, not the most comfortable spot here for, uh, for black. Some checkmates. Some checkmates in the air, just some. So b4, not playable. Uh, b takes c4, not playable. Magnus chose the move rook a to c8. And now Ding Loren can simply win this pawn on b5. Uh, sorry, this wasn't played in the game. Uh, C takes b5 was played in the game. Ding Loren, or sorry, Magnus Carlsen's idea was to play rook c5 here. But after queen b3, can't take this with the major piece because the bishop defends. We have a4, sorry, a takes b5, and then a4, taking advantage of the pin on the pawn. If you try to play the move b4, we've seen this story before. No matter which piece is in front, this battery against f7 is still going to be rather devastating, with bishop takes f7 being a humongous threat. Rook f8 is just a little bit too passive now for, uh, for black, as white is going to be able to utilize both rooks on the queen side, while black will have to keep one rook behind to defend. And so 
uh, in the game, Magnus just gives up on the pawn on b5. We see bishop takes b5, and now black does finally manage to activate this piece. Rook d3, though, keeps it out of the game for the moment. Rook c1 check would not achieve much here, just king up to a2. And at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's just Ding Loren with an extra pawn. And in fact, it almost feels like two extra pawns as these two pawns on the queen side are passed and connected and their counterpart is on d6, which is always a sad pawn in these positions for black. Uh, in the game, Ding had some very good technique, plays the move rook d1. We do see rook c1 check, rook takes d1, rook takes d1. The bishop comes up to f4. Ding happily plays the move h3. Uh, we see bishop e3. Like I said, this bishop does get active eventually, but it's not enough in this case. Bishop c4 finally arrives on the board, this sort of lurking threat that has been uh, narrowly avoided by Magnus for the past 10 turns. Now queen b3, and sorry, not bishop, but king takes b3. And bishop d4, rook d2, f5, rook c2, takes, takes. King f6 played in the game, bishop b5, rook b8, king b4, king g5. And then the technique here is simply a matter of pushing these pawns up the board. It is not the d most difficult win in the world. Once again, black's only uh, extra pawn, quote unquote, anywhere on the board is on d6, and it's not going to be useful in this case. So Ding goes on to win quite easily. a5, throws in rookie 2 to defend this guy. a6 whenever possible. Bishop c5 check, king a5. Bishop a7. B3, sort of the waiting move, allowing this rook to uh, participate over on the queen side. Also, granting this bishop the c4 square. See rook a1 check, king b5, rook b1, king c6, bishop c5, king b7, rook a1, and then after b4, Magnus had seen enough. Uh, very smooth victory for Ding Loren here. Uh, I really do think that this is the game to highlight the, the d5 square in all of these Sicilian positions where e5 is ever potentially playable. Um, in this game, Magnus lost control of d5, Ding Loren played a very excellent game and went on to win using this control, getting this favorable position of the bishops. Magnus Carlsen and Ding Loren, Ding jumping out to an early lead, but then Magnus being the world champion, had the white pieces in game two. And this is something that you'll see Magnus Carlsen do uh, quite a bit. Uh, he'll lose one game, rarely, very rarely, but then when he does, he tends to win the next one. Uh, he's, this is something that I, I think a lot of the world's greatest chess players throughout history have sort of had a habit of doing. Uh, Gary Kasparov definitely comes to mind. If you were paired with Gary and you saw that he lost his last game, then I think the stories go that you might as well just resign because Gary was not losing two in a row. Uh, and that's the case for Magnus here. He came back with the white pieces and he came back to win. So let's see what happened in game two. We have d4, knight f6, knight f3, d4. Everybody's favorite opening, the London system, c5, e3, e6, c3, and we are well uh, in the clutches of the London. Bishop d6 is the natural move by Ding Loren, or bishop g3, not allowing e takes f4, weakening the d4 pawn uh, slightly. In the game, though, Magnus says, nah, I'll have none of that, and just plays the move knight b to d2. And this is a pretty interesting decision. Uh, Right now, black has the option to go for this imbalance. And I wanted to talk just a little bit about this pawn structure because it's a pretty interesting one. Uh, likely, Magnus's follow-up after c takes d4 isn't to take back with the pawn, but to take back with the knight. And so the question is, what exactly is going on in this position? Well, black has two central pawns, and so at first glance, you might say that black has an advantage in the center. However, because white does not have any central pawns, but is controlling them with, uh, but is controlling the center with pawns from the outside, it might turn out to be a case where white can actually occupy the center with his pieces, which would be uh, pretty advantageous compared to occupying it with the pawns. And this is an interesting game that we never got to see because this is not what Ding Loren played. Instead, he chose the move c takes d4 which, you know, is, is pretty natural. 
likely, he assumed white would reply. C takes d4. Uh, e takes d4 is notably a move that is uh, now prevented due to white's play, not preserving this bishop with bishop g3 or knight e5 or trading it off. Now, of course, e takes d would hang the bishop. And after c takes d, uh, the game would be you know, reasonably e even, uh, reasonably level. Then Ding might consider taking here when white could no longer take on d4 with the knight, having already captured with the pawn. And here, black might be uh, very, very happy to apply some pressure to the slightly weak d4 pawn. Now, Magnus Carlsen had other intentions for this position, though. C takes d4 is an attempt at sort of refuting Magnus's opening play. Not refuting in the sense that black would be winning, but refuting in the sense that Magnus would have nothing to play for, really, after the move C takes d4. This would be a very level position, uh, and especially after bishop takes f4, it's black with the pressure on white's center. But Magnus, being Magnus, was like, nah, I'll take on d6 instead. I'll have none of that, thank you. Uh, and Ding could have just captured back on d6 with the queen, but now e takes d4 would once again be playable. And this is, of course, the uh, fabled Carlsbad structure. And here I do believe Magnus might be ever so slightly better, just because this bishop has not uh, had all of its problems solved yet. Black is going to have to work pretty hard to, to activate this guy here. And so Ding Loren uh, instead plays the move d takes e3. And this is Magnus's idea. He sacrifices uh, both of his center pawns in order to take off the dark squared bishop and preserve his dark squared bishop on the very strong diagonal on a3, uh, currently preventing castling. Uh, Ding manages to regain its piece with e takes d2. We see queen takes d2, and now knight c6. Um, and now we see uh, an idea which you will often see in either you know games played by the world champion or 2800s, 2700 level players, or you'll see it in a game between you know uh, like 400s, 500s, new players to chess. And that is the idea of the strong attacking queen. Go, go queen, go. Attack those pawns. Those pawns are nothing. And so Magnus very aggressively does play this move, queen g5. And the idea is now that Magnus Carlsen has sacrificed both of his center pawns. What does he have in exchange? Well, he has control over the dark squares. And this idea is very, very important since Magnus has sacrificed so much. Uh, I keep saying he sacrificed both central pawns. Of course, he's only down one pawn here. Uh, he got the C pawn in return. But lacking both pawns in the center does mean that if you play too slowly, black is sort of just going to, uh, to roll over your position in the center. So no center pawns for white. Uh, which is why it's so important that Magnus immediately starts taking control of the dark squares and uses this to his advantage, because that is really the only imbalance in white's favor here, his control over the dark squares. And that's why queen g5 makes so much sense here. You know, it'd be great to develop this bishop, but this isn't really going along with Magnus's plan of controlling the dark squares. And in fact, it does present black the opportunity to play e5 and start regaining control of at least some of those squares, right? Queen g5, move that prevents both e5, pressures more dark squares on the king side, and is essentially baiting black into playing a move like g6 when wow, oh wow, oh wow, you'll never control any of these squares ever again if you're playing with the black pieces. And that is a terrifying thought. Uh, in the game, Ding chose a slightly better option than g6, which is rook g8. Uh, but once again, I just want to highlight the idea here. Magnus's idea isn't to launch some kind of crazy attack with his queen from the opening. That would be the idea uh, of you know the 400s and the 500s that you see do the crazy queen openings where they attack you know anywhere on the board. Magnus's idea is to take control of the dark squares, and that's exactly how you need to play when you have managed to trade off one of your opponent's bishops for one of your knights, right? You take over the color square that uh, your opponent is lacking. Okay, rook g8, and Magnus now simply develops his last piece with bishop d3. Uh, we now see the move h6, and this is the right idea, once again, from Ding Loren. Uh, he, 
he is lacking the dark squared bishop, so to make up for it, he starts trying to control dark squares with his pawns. This is a good way to compensate when you are missing that bishop. The queen comes back to e3, and Ding plays queen b6. Note that the entire story of this game now is a game being fought on the dark squares. It's like these squares, they don't matter, right? Neither player is arguing that these squares are good for black. Magnus is uh, pretty much solely playing for control of these dark squares. Now, trading off the queens would obviously be in black's favor here, as he is up, like I said, a full pawn and has two extra center pawns, so queen e2 was played in the game. Uh, now, Ding Loren plays bishop d7, trying to get developed. We see white go ahead and castle, and black queen side castles. Uh, okay. Now, what's next for Magnus Carlsen? I would like to ask you guys at home to take a moment and find out uh, what you think Magnus should be doing next with his time here. How do you continue to fight even harder for the dark squares in black's position? How do you fight for those dark squares? Deep Mind says maybe b3 and c4 and attack. And there's a couple people in the chat who say the move b4. What's your idea with the move b4? Why play b4 here? Why play the move b4? Knight e5 is also suggested. Any other ideas? OK, so let's talk about knight e5. So knight e5, I definitely think, is actually alleviating some of the pressure for black. Uh, and the reason for that is you are trading this knight, which controls dark squares, for this knight, which also controls dark squares. So after knight e5, knight e5, it's true that you removed a defender of the dark squares, you also removed an attacker of the dark squares, though. And now, the only pieces that white can immediately utilize to attack on these long open diagonals, or weak, weak squares in the center, are the queen and the bishop. Whereas he would rather much have uh, this, he would much rather have this knight back on f3 to jump into e5 at a later date. And that's exactly why I do believe b4, which Magnus chose, and it, is the best idea for white in the game. Now, why b4? Nobody in the chat managed to answer my question. Well, the point is not that you're controlling these two squares more. The point is that you're angling to play the move b5. And we'll see that's exactly what happens in the game. King b8, b5. And now we have, in fact, fought for the dark squares by removing this defender of the dark squares without giving up our own piece. The move knight a5 was played in the game, and now after knight e5, I think Magnus already has a, a very significant advantage in the game. Uh, Black actually only had one move to maintain the balance in this case, and that move was to play e5, which is sort of counterintuitive, right? Uh, the idea is tactically it does work out for Black. You can respond to b5 with the move e4, and after takes on c6, you don't take on d3 or f3 when this would come with check but you can take back on c6 yourself. And then, um, let's see, maybe with the bishop is simpler. And then after something like knight d4, you get rid of these pieces. And now uh, black has given up his extra pawn, but because he's given up the pawn, he can find activity along the e file, as well as jump this knight into nice squares like e4 at a later date, notably defending some loose dark squares in his position. Okay. But e5 is not the most intuitive move, and honestly, I still don't fully understand why black is doing OK there against uh, the, some pretty powerful white pieces. But we will stick to the game. King b8, b5 played in the game, which is a great idea by Magnus. Knight a5, and now knight e5. And like I said, Magnus has sort of taken over uh, essentially half of the chessboard, uh, meaning all of the dark squares on the board are starting to belong to Magnus Carlsen. 
bishop e8 played in the game, had to defend f7 somehow, and now bishop b4. And this is what I mean by all the dark squares. Magnus is not even content to allow this knight on a5 to rest peacefully. Black is going to have to work to keep a piece on a dark square, keeping this piece defended at all times. Uh, we see the move rook to c8, and now Magnus, Magnus's other idea with bishop b4 is to bring the a pawn forward out to a4 to go ahead and support this b5 pawn. Uh, knight e4 is Ding Lorenz's choice in the game, and this is sort of the final blunder of the, uh, of the game here. This one really does allow Magnus to win the position quite easily. Uh, maybe better for Ding was to retreat this queen back with the idea of after, maybe back to c7. And the idea is to bring this knight out to e4 a little bit later on and have a little bit more control on this uh, seventh rank. But let's just see why knight e4 loses the game. Knight e4, Magnus simply takes, 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 and now there are a myriad of threats. If you stop the move queen h7, then white simply takes over in the center with something like rook f to d1. This bishop can't move. Rook d6 is coming. For example, f6, rook d6, takes here. Things are just sort of collapsing. Bishop d6 is the threat. And so in the game, we saw f6 immediately, but now, of course, queen h7 was not prevented and there's no comfortable way to defend this rook. If you move this bishop, bam, knight d7 is awkward. If you take on e5, it just takes on g8, and life is not getting better for Ding. In the game, you played knight b3, Magnus took on g8, takes on e1, and then the final move of the game, queen takes e8 with knight d7 to follow, was enough for Ding Loren to give this one up. Uh, so really incredible game here by Magnus. Shows exactly how to play against a missing bishop in your opponent's position. You just aim to take over half of their squares. All of the dark squares in this game belonging to Magnus, and that is what allowed him to win the game with very active pieces. Okay, any questions on this one in particular? And then we'll move on to uh, one or two games by the other semifinalists, uh, of course, Daniel Dubov and Hikaru Nakamura. I do want to mention that while Ding uh, did lose this game on the first day, he actually went on, I believe, to win day one in Armageddon against Magnus. And then Magnus, unfortunately for Ding, did come back to win the next three days to advance on to the finals. All right, let's go ahead and move on then. I did want to start with uh, one of Dubov's only wins against Nakamura. Naka played very, very well against Dubov in their semifinal matchups, uh, and I believe won uh, all three days of their match to advance to the finals. But Dubov had one or two nice games, and this was definitely one of them. Uh, if you guys are a fan of miniatures, this one I believe qualifies under most definitions. But let's just jump into it here. See what happens. Dubov plays d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, going for the Nimzo Indian, and then we have knight f3. So a uh, three knights, I believe it's called, rather than two knights, Nimzo. And this is a reasonably solid way of playing against the Nimzo for white. Uh, some of the more ambitious lines involve leaving this knight back on g1. Queen c2 is the classical uh, Nimzo Indian to help defend this knight on c3. I, of course, if you have been following me for some time now, am a huge fan of the f3 Nimzo Indian challenging the e4 square directly. e3, also a main move, but knight f3, one of the more solid approaches. We have kingside castles by black, and then bishop g5 by white. And the point here is that this bishop has left the king side by coming out to b4, and so if we go bishop g5, Maybe uh, this bishop would be better served on e7 in some cases for black. Uh, also notably, if white or black were to play something like this, we could still come out to uh, bishop g5. But in some of these cases, black is afforded a little bit more freedom to sort of kick around this bishop with stuff like h6 and g5 because he hasn't yet committed to castling. Uh, for example, h6, bishop h4, 
and G5 is already a, a pretty well-known line. 94 to follow, and we can take advantage of some of the awkwardness of white's pieces. But uh, Hikaru simply castles. Now bishop G5, and black is a lot less comfortable playing H6 and G5 when his king is sitting here on G8. So in the game, simply C5 by Hikaru, and rook to C1 by uh, Dubov, and now h6, bishop h4, but Naka isn't planning to follow this up with g5 in this case, just kicking this bishop off of the g5 square, where it had some options to retreat along this diagonal. And now c takes d4 is the plan for Nakamura. He wants to get rid of the strong central d4 pawn from white, and we do see knight takes d4 now by black, or sorry, by white, and then Nakamura attempts to sort of immediately equalize with the move d5. And this is something that uh, you actually see a lot from uh, Nakamura in the way he's playing against 1d4. Uh, he's very happy to go for a quick c5, and then he will, pretty early on in the opening generally, try and solve all of his opening problems with a break like d5. Now, uh, the downside to this is perhaps in some games, perhaps in particular this game, black was not yet ready to break through with d5. Uh, as far as other choices, knight c6 has been played with some success, uh, and following this up with d5 can be quite good. Even bishop back to e7, playing the, the position very, very slowly, uh, taking advantage or breaking this pin, uh, even if it is at the cost of a tempo. And Nakamura himself, I believe, has actually had this exact position against Levon Aronian. But in this game, he goes for d5. Now, what's the downside to playing d5 immediately? Well, in a perfect world, this is how the game would go. We would have c takes d5. We'd have something like queen takes d5 and something like e3, knight e4. And black would have absolutely no issues in this case. Rook b1, for example, and now the point is black has a very compact pawn structure, white has no real advantages in the center of the board, and black can just continue with natural development with something like knight c6. Now, why wasn't this what happened in the game? Well, Naka was likely a little bit uncomfortable about white's option to play the move bishop takes f6 here after queen d5. g takes f6 would be forced, and now black's kingside is a little bit fractured. And like I said, this might not be something that Nakamura is quite happy with. He is essentially trying to solve his opening problems immediately. And with this fractured king side, he definitely still has some problems to solve. The game might continue a3. If this bishop moves back, then the queen hangs. So knight c6 is now forced. Knight takes c6, bishop takes c3, rook c3, queen d1, king d1, bc6. And actually white is already sort of winning a pawn, or is he? Maybe, maybe he's winning a pawn. Maybe it's better just to develop rather than face some awkwardness on the queen side. But okay, obviously queen d5, not as simple as it may seem because this bishop on h4 is still challenging this knight here. So in the game, Nakamura's idea was to play the move g5 first, not allowing bishop takes f6, and then he was able to take back with the knight on d5. And this might actually be the move that gives white a little bit of an edge. And this position has been reached actually well over 20 times, and uh, a lot of those times by very high level players. And queen takes d5 has been played in every single game. The idea being, after white tries to develop naturally, black is able to get some very immediate counterplay on the queen side to make up for his fractured king side structure. Not quite as bad as g takes f6, but h6 and g5 definitely leaves quite a number of weaknesses over here. And so essentially in all these games, black is able to sort of leverage this pressure on the queen side, this extra pawn for the moment, into some kind of queen trade or trading off more pieces so that these weaknesses on the king side don't really matter. Now in the game, Naka plays knight takes d5 immediately. And without this active queen coming into a2, unfortunately Nakamura does not have the activity required to get some of those trades, uh, some of those pieces off the board to make up for the fact that he has weakened his king side. In the game, Dubov simply plays e3, and now queen a5. But queen a5 to a2 is not quite the same 
as queen d5 to a2, as we shall soon see. Uh, bishop d3 played in the game, and now queen takes a2 would very readily be, be met with castles when all of a sudden, you know, black is, is just simply checkmated. You can compare this with the line after queen d5, e3, queen takes a2. Here, if bishop d3 were played, now knight d5 would be the position we just saw, but of course black can play queen takes b2, and is that one tempo faster that he absolutely needs to be able to uh, survive this position. Uh, so, in the game, queen a5, bishop d3, now castles is a huge threat, and black is sort of simply uh, lost out of the opening already. Castles is pretty difficult to stop. If you take on c3, white will recapture back. If you take here, queen d2 is actually a rather annoying pin that would win a full piece. And so, and this knight might have, to, might have to jump back to f6, and white has a few options, non, not the least of which is to just play something like h4, or even queen f3, followed by something like h4, and just break open the king side, taking advantage of black's hubris in the opening. Uh, in the game, uh, Hikaru plays the move rook d8, and Dubov just castles, and now queen h5 is a massive, massive threat. Uh, and in fact, knight takes c3 played in the game. Dubov doesn't even bother taking this piece back. He says, I will go checkmate you now. Thank you very much. Bishop f8 is forced to guard this guy. If he tried to save this uh, guy here, everybody knows this checkmate. Queen h7, or actually, yeah, or if something like f5, just take here. And everything is falling apart. So queen h5, bishop f8 was played. Rook takes c3 now, regains the piece. e5, bishop c4, ouch, queen c7, and bishop takes e5. And that was enough for Hukaro Nakamura to resign this game. So probably Naka just mixed up lines with knight takes d5 and queen takes d5, and that ended up costing him a full point in this case. I, I do want to mention, though, this was one of the only full points that Nakamura lost in the entirety of the three matches that he played with Dubov, but I did want to highlight this game uh, since Dubov had such a rough go of it this time around. Let us now move on to yet another game between Dubov and Nakamura, and this is going to be one that actually did end up going Naka's way. Uh, one of the many in this case. And we are actually going to see it arise from a pretty similar opening. So let's check it out, see what Hikaru did differently in this case. We have d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, knight f3, and again, castles, bishop g5, and c5. Now, this is where, in the previous game, we actually saw uh, Dubov play the move rook c1. c takes d4, knight takes d4. Then we had this h6, bishop h4, and d5, and complications that Naka ended up messing up. However, Dubov likely suspected that Nakamura had checked his file since the last game, or just remembered since the last game, and so he chose not to repeat uh, this variation. Instead, he played a very, very combative move, and that move is d5. And now, of course, the position starts to resemble uh, Benoni, Benoni-style positions. Uh, there is one key difference from most Benoni positions, and that is rather than this bishop being here, this bishop is here. And so fans of the snake Benoni will know that the bishop on b4 is actually not such a bad piece for black compared to the bishop back on g7. And black shouldn't be too unhappy about having this guy out here, in my opinion. Uh, d6 was Naka's choice in the game. And now e3. And this is sort of part of the unfortunate uh, status of the white pieces. Because this bishop is already here on b4, White has to work a lot harder to gain control over the e4 square. Uh, for example, if e4 were played immediately, uh, perhaps some of the difficulty would revolve around the immediate rook e8. If you try bishop d3, be on the lookout for knight takes e4 tactics, free queen, but you lose your queen as well. So e3 played instead by Dubov, and now we see e d5, c takes d5, and knight b to d7. Now after bishop d3, white does have the advantage of not having this diagonal locked down by uh, the pawn on e4, 
But white also lacks a lot of the uh, threats that you get from the mainline Benonis, where this pawn ends up on e4 very, very quickly. Now we do see h6 by Hikaru, kicking this bishop away once again. We do see the bishop coming back to h4. And then Naka plays this move, queen a5, you know. Perhaps already, you know, getting rid of those bad memories from the last game when he played queen a5 and immediately got checkmated. In this game, he at least has the solace of knowing that his king side is not going to immediately get destroyed. Uh, Dubov castles out of this one. And this is, in fact, just a pawn sacrifice by Dubov. And I think this is uh, about as good of a pawn sacrifice, or sorry, about as uh, good of a pawn for black as you can really hope for in the Benoni. Uh, by getting rid of this extra B pawn that white has, if black can achieve something like B5 and C4, uh, Black is going to win on the queen side. Like, there's nothing stopping Black from just straight winning on the queen side. And so what that does is it puts White in a situation where White had better do something, uh, you know, either to stop this or uh, on the king's side pretty quickly, or else, you know, he, he's just going to get rolled over. And we'll see that in this case, Dubov actually was not able to, uh, to add that kind, of, or to apply that kind of pressure to Black's position. Perhaps his best try would have been to play the immediate bishop g3, when you can already see that, hey, wait a second, maybe this queen is a little bit off sides here, not back on, in the center on d8, on c7, to guard this guy. The play might continue with something like c4, or knight takes d5, uh, when black gives up his d-pawn, but does manage to capture white's d-pawn. Uh, and there is one game here between Le Quang Liem and Peter Lecco, that went bishop b5, knight 5 to f6, bishop takes d6, rook e8, rook c1, queen back to a5, queen out to b3, queen b6. So black does have to take a few moves with this queen to get it back into play. And after rook f to d1, uh, white isn't worse, but white is much better either. Uh, these bishops, for the moment, are looking a little bit... Uh, dangerous, but after a6, this bishop actually has nothing better to do than exchange it here. And we see more trades. Uh, I'm sorry, knight takes d7 was played in the game. Bishop c5. And this position is dead drawn. And so this is about as well as I think it can actually go for white. Instead, though, Dubov plays the move e4. And this is the more testing try. Rather than go for these simplifications, allow black to take on d5, allow yourself to take on d6, Dubov plays e4 and says, nah, I'm keeping my d5 pawn. You do what you want. I am going to uh, try and win this game. Rook e8 is a natural move by black to challenge the e4 pawn now. Rook e1 to support. And now Hikaru plays a very, very interesting move, and that move is b5. So he's willing to give up his B pawn in exchange for the E pawn. Uh, and this B5 move, I believe, is, is a very, very valuable uh, move by Nakamura. Uh, if this B pawn is allowed to live, then uh, the move C4 is going to be coming next, and this bishop is quickly going to run out of squares. This knight is going to come in on those squares. This knight as well can come back to E5 and invade on d3, and black would just have a very, very excellent position. So with all of that in mind, white definitely needs to do something about it before it happens. One option would have been to play the move a4, when now after c4, this bishop just drops back to c2, and b4 would be a bit too much when after rook e3, queen b2, rook b1, this pawn does end up falling. Uh, one other option might be to actually accept this trade and drop this bishop into c6, excuse me, uh, rook b8 for example, bishop g3, and at the end of the day it's going to be rather similar to what we saw in that uh, Lequang against, or Liam Le against uh, Peter Leko game, where this one is likely going to fizzle out. But instead Daniel Dubov plays rook c1, attacking the queen, but this queen was actually off sides on c3, and Akaro is very happy to bring it over to a3, where it can sort of indirectly at least help this d-pawn out a little bit, and stop a4, prepare c4, and prepare to kind of just win this game. 
Uh, bishop b1 played in the game, and I do think c4 is pretty reasonable here for black. Maybe, though, Hikaru was not yet ready to give up the d4 square to uh, his opponent, so he delays it for a bit, just plays knight g4, and reroutes this knight back to e5. Knight d2 is attacking this guy. Knight b6 to support the queen side play and defend the knight. We see h3, and now knight e5. And I do believe that uh, I would much rather be black in this position than white. All the pressure is sort of on white in this case. And that's the danger that you face when you sacrifice such an important pawn on the queen side against the Benoni. Uh, queen h5 now played in the game. And this turned out to be a, a pretty crucial mistake. Knight b to c4. Uh, knight, the knight comes over to b3. And now a5. And like I said, black is going to win on the queen side. Uh, now, maybe Dubov could have tried playing something like f4. This knight would retreat probably back to either d7 or g6. And something like e5. This is sort of the, the desperate attacking uh, play that white has to go for already in, in this case. And, you know, maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't. Who can really tell? It's going to be a, a complex attack to be sure. But this is sort of what white already has to go for. If you don't break things open immediately, black just wins. And in the game, we see rook c3 was played. And exactly what I've been describing did, in fact, happen. Queen b4 now. The rooks are sort of skewered. Uh, the rook comes over to c1. And knight g6 was played by Naka, stepping out of f4 before it happens. Bishop f6 was Dubov's try, uh, perhaps asking Naka to capture here when queen takes a6 might offer a little bit of uh, danger to, to Naka's king with ideas of this coming. Uh, instead, though, just a4 to attack the knight. The rook comes to g3, but now rook e5. Naka does not capture this bishop, fracturing his structure. In fact, he offers up an exchange, which is accepted, but now this knight is actually incredibly trapped. Knight a1 would not be ideal. Queen b2 would actually attack three pieces at the same time. And so knight takes c5 is played. We do see d takes c5. And Naka has two pieces for the rook. And like I said, is winning on the queen side. Rook f1, queen d4, uh, king h2, rook a6, f4. This rook comes over to f6 now. And it's sort of checkmate or bust for Dubov. Unfortunately, in this case, it is bust, as we see him launching those pawns forward on the queen side without getting checkmated. <laughs> Just moving them forward step by step, and then we do see Dubov giving back the exchange to avoid a queen trade. And once again, these pawns are too powerful, and Dubov went ahead and resigned in this position. So some really fun games uh, from the finals of the Magnus Carlsen Invitational. Here we see Nakamura sort of just uh, stampeding on the queen side to defeat Daniel Dubov in this particular game. And I did very much enjoy the battles between Magnus Carlsen and Ding Loren. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this edition of The Road to 2000. Be sure to stay tuned for the end game class where I'm going to teach you everything you ever wanted to know and ever didn't want to know about playing with a rook against a bishop in pure end games. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be a fun one. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Uh, but that's it for me here, t uh, here tonight on The Road to 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.